start the conversation. Great. One, two, three. Welcome to the Provoke podcast. I'm Arthi Shaw, your host for today's episode, which I think will be packed full of fascinating information. So everybody get ready, you should take notes. Um, we have today with us Jim Weiss, who of course is the founder and CEO of the healthcare and analytics powerhouse, W2O Group. Welcome to the show, Jim. Hey, Arthi. How are you? Well, so we were just saying, talking about how we, we, the headlines change daily. So let's, let's make this podcast a bit of a time capsule. Jim, based on scanning the headlines today, what was the most surprising thing that you've seen so far? Well, actually, I think, you know, none of it is getting surprising. That's what's surprising. Um, so, you know, you look at, you know, this higher incidence or the fact that we just saw a headline that someone in California died before the person in, you know, uh, Washington State. Um, you know, I was convinced it was here before then, too, and probably has been since the beginning of the year, if not even before that. So, uh, you know, that might have surprised people, but I think we're going to get more data now and we're going to find out from you know a lot of this epidemiology it's probably been here longer things that we thought were the flu or COVID-19 and you know the other big one that came out is this idea that a second wave is coming but I think that wasn't exactly well contexted in my view because Flu season is always a reality and now we're probably better equipped for flu season than we've ever been because of social distancing and all of the education about washing your hands, that applies to flu as well. So I think if we apply both principles, we can probably you know, reduce both of those in the fall, uh, those diseases, you know, flu and COVID-19. Yeah, right. I mean, if people, if people are this vigilant about washing their hands and if we can end handshaking culture, that will probably go a long way. Um, to, to even just reducing the flu, the, the colds, like, right, the seasonal colds that people get. Um, well, I guess that's a good question about the narrative. And, and, and just for our listeners, I mean, there's two things I really want to talk about with Jim, and that's how Jim as a CEO managed, um, is managing the outbreak with his agency, but, and also to get his insights, obviously, on, um, on the healthcare sector. But, you know, before we go into agency management, I have one more question is, is, is to get your sense on the overall narrative. Like, what messages do you think have broken through and, and where do you think it's completely fallen apart? And what are some of the lessons as we go into summer and fall? Well, I think the, the message about social distancing <clears throat> has broken through and we get it. Uh, not everyone is happy about it, understandably, relative to their economic situation. I think, you know, the, the her heroism of the healthcare worker is, you know, breaking through and critical. And I think people are appreciating, you know, their their local healthcare provider and and in ways they never really did before. So there's an appreciation for those issues. I think, you know, this concept of testing, tracking, and treatments that we need to get back to work in a more normal way in life. But I think all that will happen. We just, you know, need to catch up on testing, which we will. You know, the volume will pick up. There are plenty of you know providers coming on board and online. Uh, I think you're going to find you know the tracing and tracking. I, I saw an excellent piece last night about how this could be a great place for some of the laid off workers to go and you know track and trace in local markets. And I think you saw a blog I posted. Everything's going to be local. I, I always say, and I'm often informed by all PR is local. So you know the ability and capability to track in a local town like right near me in Bolinas, which is out you know, in Western Marin County. They are you know, for free, although a bunch of guys funded it, you know, Venture and Biotech guys funded tests for everyone in the town to look at you know, both the antibody and the incidence of the disease to see if and what kind of patterns emerge. So that tracking and tracing is really important. And then treatments, you know, treatments are breaking through. We have to make sure we don't overpromise, you know, there and underdeliver. And that's obviously a big, you know, job that we have as a healthcare communications firm, counseling clients. You know, let's make sure there's really good data, peer review. You know, there's there's a lot of debate right now. I think the NIH today came out with their treatment guidelines 
you know, for the first time. So I'd refer everyone to that. But the point being, you know, you're going to see a lot of things tested and tried, but not everything will work. So, you know, the one word that you use that, that I think there is not agreement on what that means is normal, right? I mean, I think, I think Gavin Newsom has come out and said today that we shouldn't expect any, or that was yesterday, I suppose, we shouldn't expect any sense of sort of normalcy in the near future. You know, and there's obviously another camp that's trying to, you know, reopen the economy as if like, you know, we'll just, we just restart the engine. Um, so, I mean, what do you think about that word in today's context? I think the tension between you know, the need for public safety and getting the economy back is a good one and we have to address it. I have told a lot of people, I am empathetic to the, you know, feelings of wanting to get back to work, especially when you're surrounded by people, you know, not a high number or count. So I, I think, you know, it's very important that these two things get balanced. And I think people are willing and able. I saw a woman in Georgia interviewed who said, look, I got a kid to raise, so I'm gonna make my, you know, hair salon, you know, as safe as I can make it, six feet apart, you know, staggered scheduling, wearing masks, cleaning. You know, I thought, well, here, this person really understands what it's gonna take to get people back to work. The testing part will obviously be a big thing should probably have to take temperatures initially before there's you know ubiquitous and easy testing but that's coming and we'll have that you know i think by late summer early fall by the time flu season comes around you'll be able to test more regularly and people can stay out if they have that sniffle they can find out is that a flu or a cold or is it covid and i i do think you know you know we should give the american people a lot more credit you know, especially these smaller entrepreneurs, you know, they want to get back to work. And now the other big debate is, will big companies get, you know, a statutory or legal pass on any liability around the virus, which, you know, no employer can control for sure. I mean, they closed Tyson Foods today, but at some point you're going to have to reopen those places and we're going to have to come up with practical ways to live with this. You know, that is no doubt. And Newsom has a big task force, you know, made up of some of the great business titans of, you know, the past 20 years. And let's see, you know, if they and others around the country, you're definitely seeing, you know, really smart business people pivoting their businesses and making it work. So I'm a big believer that these, that tension is healthy and it's going to be worked through. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about what, what the business owners are doing to, to, to ensure the safety. But what about from a consumer behavior pr perspective? What do you think consumers need to hear to feel safe going into the salons, to going, I think they've opened up bowling alleys or they're opening up bowling alleys in Georgia and I think theaters and restaurants next week. Um, but I wonder if they're going to be empty. Like what, what message do consumers need to hear to feel safe? I think they're going to need to know that, you know, your practice, again, bowling alleys, you can put up to 10 people in a corner, you know, again, as long as people are practicing the right things with the mask and the gloves and, the, you know, if they feel that, uh, you know, workplace has been sanitized, the only problem, of course, is, you know, do we have enough wipes, sanitizers and cleaning products to do it? with a fair amount of you know uh confidence but remember we've been now in this for weeks people have been getting packages they've been getting groceries and for the most part if you look all over the country we flatten the curve so i do think that consumers feel like they're a part of the solution and if we're really smart we're going to make them part of the solution as you know i've talked about the consumerization of healthcare. And that is the mission, really the true mission of our firm, which is to make the world a healthier place through marketing communications. I think if you leverage people and their ingenuity and their determination, they're going to come up with the best solutions for their local situation time and time again. And I absolutely see really cool things coming of it. I think like the Jack Daniels, you know, kind of pivoting and helping, helping companies make the hand sanitizer. You know, so many different brands can play a role here, not just traditional healthcare and biotech brands. Every company is going to become, in a way, a healthcare company. We've never had to do that. I think you and I were talking about it. One of the reasons this has been so hard 
is that our government people are not healthcare people. So this is taking them by surprise. They're not really used to it. You need to listen to data. So for firms like ours, this came second nature, not a big deal. But for other firms that aren't as used to this, they need to learn new vernaculars and new behaviors, you know, but that's the exciting opportunity. We all have a chance to become, you know, our own healthcare companies with guidance and, and capabilities well beyond what we thought we could do. I mean, I would imagine some both, both agencies and also, you know, brands are reluctant to, that, to, to play in the space because they don't necessarily have the permission or they don't have the vernacular or they don't have the data and, and they don't want to seem like they're just being opportunistic. Well, how would you advise, you know, a, a company in this reality that, you know, hey, you have to, you have to, you're a healthcare company now, but without, when they don't have the expertise to feel comfortable in that space. Well, yeah, I, the way I, you start at home, always start with your people, right? It comes with your employee brand. First start, you know, first start with your, you asked me how I was managing this. First, you start with your own workforce, right? You make them feel safe, secure, you know, showing you're capable of, you know, again, what did we do quickly? We sheltered at home. That was the most simple, obvious thing. Then you've got to provide things for your workers so they can come back and you see, you know, where workers feel like they've been not as well prepared or treated. So if you look at nursing homes or, you know, even certain healthcare environments, you know, so even Amazon had a hundred person walkout recently, you've got to get that workplace ready to go. When they converted the GM plant for ventilators, they showed you how, you know, everyone went in, got their temperature taken, you know, this can be done. You know, it's just a total overhaul of the system. And then what's the other big one? You know, less travel, which is not great initially for airlines and tourism. But eventually people will learn how to go do that again. Because, come on, we, we got to go travel and see people and life has to move on. So no country like this one comes up with great ideas in the time of need. Right. So that is always, I think, what happens in these situations and you're seeing it. And I see some companies are doing a really good job of it. And, you know, some are possibly struggling, but I think all can find a way to be relevant in this situation. It's all about relevance and it's about looking, you know, we do a relevance index and it's really important to figure out maybe through data and analytics and research, where's the white space, where can I play where I'm not ambulance chasing, but I'm actually being a good citizen for my people and for my, you know, fellow man and humans. But you're yeah. seeing a lot of good examples. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, this really is coming down to trust, right? That seems to be what's at the core here. Um, you know, I was thinking about the pharma industry because I know they have had some reputational issues, in, you know, over the last few few years. Um, how do you think that will change for the pharma industry? Maybe? Well, today there's a hair. That's some news out today. Maybe that surprised me. You know, the Harris poll showed today that um, you know the industry is already getting a bump. But I don't believe that lasts forever. I mean, the question is, and I had an interesting talk with an infectious disease doctor in the National Health Service recently, and what he said was, and this is a guy who's developed drugs and really understands the space, got COVID-19 himself. He said, look, you know, my mission, as is many, that we come out of this better than when we went in. And I think that's the opportunity here to come out of this, you know, what things are we no longer going to do and don't need to do and what things do we have to remember to do that we've been doing that have been positive that'll make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the opportunity you know, coming out of this. And, and even going into it, it's, you know, I, I know the, the trust surveys all showed that employers were the most trusted institutions, right? Um, and government trust has just been tanking for, for years now. Well, it has, but, but you, this, so let me tell you what somebody said, this thing's like, um, you know, I think it was Anderson Cooper, a microscope on that which is weak or not as strong, it's put a microscope or at least a magnifying glass on those weaknesses. And you know, where things like 
that have been around. You know, the pharma industry, for example, has had, you know, copay assistance and a lot of other terrific programs that have helped people pay for their medicine, but you don't get the credit for that, right? They are, they're going after these other problems and issues. But now that there are pledges and all these things coming out right now to keep people on their meds through this period and ensuring supply of insulin and, you know, free drug for certain chronic diseases and conditions, you know, it's obviously helping, but we're getting, I think the industry is getting more attention because there's more of a light on it right now because of the urgency around getting a vaccine and drugs to market as soon as possible. Right. I mean, it seems like it's, it's both exposed the, 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 the fragility um, of the system, but also the innovation. Honestly. Totally. Yeah. It's, 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 a, it's everything has uh, got two sides. So, you know, you've been talking about, you know, the importance of data and the importance of relying on, on, on the research. I mean, are we looking at a move away from disinformation or misinformation? Or do you think that will, you know, and, and a move towards actually relying on the experts? Or do you think um, there's going, there's more misinformation or dis, or, and disinformation out there than ever? Oh, God, there'll be more, I think, right? I, I don't see how it's, it's not. I mean, especially now with these new agendas rising about opening up and, you know, my wife was so startled by guns in Kentucky over the head at the state house. And, you know, bottom line, I think that the organizations that want to advance certain, you know, agenda will do that. There'll be plenty of misinformation out there. We just talked to a group about, you know, you know, my um, colleague and one of our advisors, Bob Pearson, is very involved in this area, something you should probably do a follow up podcast on. But he has connected us with some people. We're going to work in, on the problem. I know Facebook's working on the problem, um, not just with us, but with academia. And, you know, they just recently issued an RFP, but, you know, they're going to give grants out for the purposes of not only tracking misinformation, but helping to reduce it. You know, obviously, we just bought Simpler. You saw we uh, added that uh, that company to our uh, analytics and data platform they track quite a bit for the NIH and the NIAID so we're we're going to double down here in terms of making sure that you know we follow the data to get to the right outcome the data has to be as accurate and real as it can be so a couple of things that I wanted to follow up with you on that you that you referenced, um, and I know you all. Well, actually, I'm going to pause for a minute and actually give our listeners some context that don't know. Um, so, W2O is a 220 million dollar agency, um, 16 global offices around the world. Um, you know, one of our one of our largest you know agencies in in, in the business and. And, and you did, Jim, so you announced, it was like March 13th, right, that you were sending everybody home. And you were early. Um, I think you, you went by what was happening in the Bay Area, which of course- San Francisco, acted, yeah, yeah. Which acted quickly. So how will you decide when to reopen and what sort of plans are you exploring for, for that next phase? I was just on the phone about, you know, the back to work plan this morning. We've been at it for quite a while, pretty much since we left. Um, you know, thinking about what are the right ways to get back. But one of the rate limiting factors, as you've heard, is testing and access to it, as well as, you know, a number of other factors. You've got to have the materials to reshape your offices so that you can put people, you know, six feet apart or three feet apart, depending on what the final guidance will be there. You've got to sort of look through all of your facilities and ensure which we're doing, you know, what we can do from, you know, a little door handle, you know, widget that you don't have to touch door handles to, you know, having gloves, plenty of gloves and masks in the office, lots of cleaning materials, wipes and, and disinfectants and all the rest. That's all in short supply. We're all chasing that, every company that's listening to this and every big company that's our client. So we are going to have to go back when we can go back. The fortunate thing here is we can adjust and work from home in ways others cannot. You know, we've been pitching business and winning business regularly. I'm sure you've heard that story from people virtually. I'm really proud of how our folks have stepped up and done, I think, the best work. Some of the best work they've ever done has been happening right now from their homes. 
Um, we've got to make sure we support folks and, and keep some of these practices that I'm talking about, the good things that we're doing. We added, you know, mental health support. We've added mindfulness and uh, meditation support. I've added uh, some child, you know, virtual childcare support. So we've done all of these additional things that we intend to continue, which I think we know we'll have to continue probably for as long as a year before we're all able to go back. I think there'll be some staggered schedules, you know, some different ways of doing things, less flying to meetings, but not, you know, not completely. I think people at some point are going to have to decide they're going to take on some risk you know, given their age and their risk profile. And there are plenty of risk calculators that will be out there. We've got the, once we have that surveillance and tracking system, we'll know if we've been in contact with someone or not. And there'll be real logical ways to plan out, you know, how you do this. It's just a change in mindset that, again, you know, we've all got to become sort of public health minded in terms of how we do this. But by the time we come out of it, I think we'll be prepared. And we're on it, figuring out ways to get as many people back as we can, talking to people who may want to stay home and are happy doing it and productive doing it. We're not going to change that, actually. So, you know, it's actually reassuring to hear you speak because I think there's a, I think there's a lot of skepticism around whether we will be able to eventually ramp up. I think because there's a lot of things that that I think people expected us to be able to have by now that we don't have, you know, the, the widespread testing, um, widespread antibodies testing, um, you know, even the availability of, like you said, simple supplies, like sanitizer and masks. And so, toilet paper, I mean, and all these things, you know, this isn't in supply. Yeah, I think, I think it's really, I think folks uh, have been surprised at how underprepared we have been as a society. So, um, so it's good to hear that, that you're, you have optimism that we will get there. It may take longer than we expected, but we will get there. We will. We will. And I think people just have to stay perseverant, work hard, and figure out, you know, smart ways to do it. And, you know, I know that's all I do from morning till night and into the weekends. You know, we're working with, you know, so many different companies working on vaccines, drugs, tests, registries, you know, tracking systems. I mean, you name it you know, they're, the work's getting done. And I do think, you know, because it's not just you or my employees that are asking this, my wife, my family, I'm at home, you know, I'm with my kid, you know, I have a teen, two teenagers at home, one who's a senior, senior year is canceled, doesn't know if he's going to go to college next year, you know, there's all this uncertainty. And we have to roll with it and evolve with it as the best we can. And I think that's, that is the key. And the more support I can provide, the more support we can provide as employers, obviously the better it'll go. So I wanna go back to something you said about, you know, there are folks that are productive and happy working from home and, and, and that might be a long-term shift. And I'm, and I'm curious to hear more about that because I've had this conversation with a lot of agency leaders around, you know, will this permanently change the way that they see working from home? Well, I met someone at a Vanity Fair conference, you know, a couple of years ago about the phenomenon of working from home and the need to do that and adapt because a lot of, I think, Arthur, you work from home, I believe, you know, I mean, when you're juggling a family and you're managing that whole job, which is huge, plus your regular job, it can be a bit simpler and easy to be closer to home to do some of that. I think some people may realize, oh, you know, my school system, not the greatest. I like this homeschooling thing. Eventually, I'll be able to possibly bring people in to do that or teach my kids digitally. So that was one big thing I wanted to mention that this situation is going to accelerate business models. I think you and I were talking about this recently that had been dormant or going slower or hadn't gotten funding yet. So that's, you know, digital education, many at home support services, you know, digital transformation, all of that. It's incredible how many companies and, and, you know, people I've talked to, they're like, Oh, yeah, we've adapted to this. And we've made this work. It is a workable situation. And I think you're going to see probably what 20% won't come back into regular workspace 
and that's probably better for the environment. That's probably better for so many things. I mean, yeah, there's going to be less gas consumption and, you know, there's some positives that come out of this and is every, they say, as one door closes, another opens. And there's going to be a lot of that going on. And the winners coming out of this are the ones who see it coming and can adapt and adjust what they're doing to that. So, um, you know, we've talked a lot about sort of information, fact-based information is so important right now and how there is so much conflicting information around there about reopening, what therapies that are working that aren't, what will be the economic fallout. How are you as a CEO making sure that your employees have the most updated information, not just about, you know, the crisis or shelter in place, but also about the, your business reality? Well, you know, we have a Friday meeting every week with me now, which we had not been doing. It's a town hall. And that is one form in which I get asked a lot of questions and I sort of give my view of things, the update, if you will, of the week. And I'm tracking this daily. So many people are watching, you know, this anyway, because let's say in New York City, you know, that the New York City situation is more acute perhaps than it is in other parts of the country. So they do have to watch what's going on day to day for their own, you know, personal health and they are. And so we're learning a ton, you know, collectively and individually. And then again, because we're in the business of it, we have to be smarter for our clients. I think just by nature, we have this and we are also doing a lot pro bono. You know, we've jumped into projects like ventilator SOS where CPAP machines are being you know transitioned as you know breathing machines to, to prevent ventilation need or so much dependence on ventilation so we end up talking to a bunch of experts about that we end up in a lot of situations just out there partnering with various groups that, about tracking and tracing and or helping getting supplies you know we have a whole initiative to help get ppe supplies to places that need it so we're learning in both the pro bono work we're doing as well as our regular work. So we're very up to the minute again, probably because we're a healthcare firm, but I'm also making it my business every day to, I always woke up knowing what was going on. And, you know, I, I really, that's a value at the firm. You have to know what we're doing to be good counselors to the clients and in those partnerships, and we're putting together a lot of third party, you know, sessions on this topic. So I think overall, we're probably among the best informed by nature. And therefore, I then inform everybody in the company. Plus, I've been doing this for 30 years. Let's not forget, I, when I went to Genentech in 1992, which is what brought me to California, we were working on an AIDS vaccine then. And it's hard to imagine that, you know, we didn't have the triplet combination therapy. AIDS wasn't a chronic disease then. It was still an infectious disease. We didn't really know all that much about. And we were learning and, and you know, I've lived through the SARS and MERS situations and worked with companies through those and obviously other crises. And so I've also brought to bear a lot of lessons from that. We're the agency of record for the AIDS 2020 conference, which is coming to San Francisco virtually again this summer. And a lot of the themes are, what did we learn from that that we can apply now? And there are a lot of things we can apply. So, you know, what, speaking about vir virtual conferences, I was, you know, reading about how lead gen activities are on the rise because so many of these tech companies, healthcare companies have not been able to have their, their, their trade shows, right? What, what services and capabilities are you finding that your clients are, are most in demand right now? Are people going to brass tacks to, you know, straight media relations? Are they wanting to look at more exploratory legion opportunities that perhaps weren't on the table before? Like what, what's surfacing? Yes, I mean, I think they, they, they're absolutely wanting to explore, you know, technology, peso media, not just earned, it's page shared, earned and owned. I'm, you know, I've got some hires coming that you'll see that are all again about this consumerization of healthcare, but I would imagine e-commerce, you're going to see more and more. I mean, Brian Weiner, who is one of the guys that graduated from Syracuse, you know, I think you probably know him as 360i. I just saw that he went got money, $20 million in fundraising, and they're doing an e-commerce 
uh, platform that'll interface with Facebook. So I just think you're going to see more and more acceleration of these tech approaches. You've been covering this phenomenon. We've been, we invested in our own. I mean, we have our own platform and we're bringing that to clients and thankfully we can meet the need because we've been building that. They're all looking for that. They're looking for e-commerce, virtual meeting, virtual ways. So again, sales reps, especially in hospitals and medical tech, cannot go into the hospital right now because of COVID. So they've got to find a way to educate on new products and new product launches another way. So you got to do that virtually. So there's a lot of accessing of virtual technologies of all types. Uh, and you know, I think the one thing we have to be careful of is that that doesn't become annoying because it's very easy to turn those things off. You still have to go at those as a corporate citizen, bringing high value information. And what's the key right now is how do we all get back to work healthily? How do we prosper? Again, both in health and in the economy. And that balance is the big balance to strike. You know, in, you know, as you know, to your point, there's, you know, there's still other diseases that are happening and that are, you know, I was reading about oncology the other day and how there's a real concern that are we still putting enough resources um, against that kind of research right now? Um, we are, we are, uh, you know, just to reassure you to some degree, mental health, for example, is going to be a big issue coming out of this COVID situation. I talked to a venture capitalist the other day, very important one in the biotech field, one of the bigger ones. And again, he is bullish about the amount raised and what they have to deploy in terms of capital. And, you know, there, there's a few out there announcing this and a lot of it are these consumer facing e-commerce, you know, tech oriented talk therapy combined with therapy, you know, ways of doing mental health delivery. Then on cancer, I'm on the board of the Cancer Research Institute. So I had to, we talked about pivoting there you know, a lot of things, oh my God, are we, gonna, you know, how many things didn't go off? All their fundraisers didn't go off. So how are they going to continue to raise money? Um, we're also, we advise Muscular Dystrophy Association. So a lot of these companies, I mean, these organizations have to pivot and educate. But just so you know, in cancer research, and especially in immunotherapy, that they they treat both things, you know, so cancer at its core is treated with immunotherapy and you know these diseases these infectious diseases like covid also similar you've heard of the cytokine storm so we're talking about that so being a resource for that you know and continued research that helps both fields advance and that is advancing we just saw a very a couple of fast you know, rare cancer approvals from the FDA. Although today I saw Barda, you know, the Barda guy walked, you know, so that's the guy everyone's going to for funding, you know, for their new drugs and tests. So, you know, we can't, the government support isn't there. The private sector is going to have to do so much of this, a lot of the heavy lifting and filling the gap, but I know they will. I mean, you see the consortiums coming together, working with the Gates Foundation and so many others. So, I think it, people should feel reassured that there's, all, there's still all kinds of research going on. It's more delayed, perhaps, and or, you know, it may take a little more time, but the funding of it and the enthusiasm around, around it hasn't really dissipated. So what would be your prediction for the long term, I mean, or I guess maybe the short term is actually probably more important, economic and talent fallout for the industry, for the peer industry? I, you know, I think we're going to see, you know, some pain. I mean, we, we just all are. I don't think, and I don't even think healthcare is impervious to it because you see hospitals going under or being threatened, you know, in terms of their ability to pay workers, pay for the things. And I think you're going to see delays. And <clears throat> But I also really feel it's it's a movement to the right. I do think as one door closes, others will open and things will evolve. You, you keep seeing this ingenuity. And so for an entrepreneur, which I am, I'm not really a CEO, I'm a founder, I'm an owner. You know, I see only opportunity in it for the most part, but there's definitely some short-term pain. There will be long-term gain. I really do truly believe it. Communications 
is leadership. Communications is essential now. So for what we do, you know, that pivot, you know, maybe you're pivoting into healthcare, maybe sciences, maybe tech a little bit more than where you've been before with your business. But most of us in this field who've grown up in it and understand it have worked on many types of products and many kinds of services. And I think for the communications field that you represent, I, I just, you know, while there is going to be some retraction in the short term, you know, you can't help that that's going to happen. I don't think that's going to be long term. Hmm. Do you think, do you think we could face a talent crunch on the back of this? Um, I was talking to an agency lead in, out of New York and he was saying that, you know, the, all of his junior employees, they fled. They all went to their, you know, these 24 year olds went to their parents' houses in Florida or Georgia or wherever that might be. But he said, what's different about this time around than, you know, in previous recessions is he's, they're, they're staying employed for now and they're doing their jobs from, you know, from not their tiny New York apartments. And, um, and that this it might change the way that he looks at hiring talent. I mean, does he need everybody to be in Manhattan for him to do, to run his agency? Oh, well, I have long, I mean, I started my agency in San Francisco and I built, you know, up, I was one of the first in Austin, you know, one of the first, uh, you know, in, in some of the, you know, I'm not the first in Minneapolis or Chicago or, but I'll, I'll go wherever the talent is. I've always felt that I've never cared one iota, even in 2001, you know, after 9-11, you know, that's when I started the firm and you, you had to start thinking about it differently then. But, you, you know, the issue out here in San Francisco has always been such a tight market because tech, you know, and the new, co new co's swallow up all the talent. I mean, I view it as, oh, it's an opportunity now for us perhaps to get some of those people, though I think, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, they're going to get a lot of the talent because they're going to be this, you know, really, they're going to be the businesses that continue very healthily. And I think, again, I want to position our firm very much. It is as a, you know, Google or Amazon of communications firms. We've always, you know, embraced technology, you know, look to deploy it for our clients and we're going to continue to do that. So no, this doesn't bother me at all. I don't care where the person is, especially uh, if they're happy. I mean, one of our very critical uh, hashtag slash, uh, you know, values is choose happiness. And I don't want anyone here that doesn't like and is not passionate about the work we're doing. And that you've got to be passionate about when you're in healthcare and sciences. And also, if you're in a place that you feel safe and happy, and you're feeling good about your surroundings, people do better work. So, you know, that's sort of simple, like everything's a lot simpler. When you end up in a crisis. I've always said as a crisis communications, you know, counselor that I've been all my career is the simplest solutions, the simplest way of handling it is the best way. Keep it simple. Don't get fancy. Keep it simple. That is a great mantra to end things on um, for the industry to sort of chew on. Well, Jim, it's always a pleasure to chat with you. Yeah, great, Arthi. Thanks for having me. I'll come back if you want, or we'll bring uh, some infectious disease expert that might be fun to have for you guys. And that, that would be amazing. That. that would be amazing because, as you know, I mean, this as we've talked about this. This isn't. This is. We're we're in this for the long haul. So there are many more conversations. Well, we and it reaches across the globe, so we can't forget that. I, you know, again, I've just written on this topic. You know, think global but act local. And this is the most universal problem we've ever seen in our lifetime, other than the environment, which, of course, this will soon bring into, you know, much more clarity. Uh, it's just amazing. My kids, of course, think the whole thing happened because it's designed to get everyone to pay attention to and save the environment. That's what my kids see this all as. So. You know, I, I, we've all we've all seen that perspective, and I think you know you think about Gen Z, right? I mean, they came of age around 9/11, and the world the world has been a difficult place since then. So wow, yeah. All right, all right. Well, thanks, Jim. The future, thanks. Here to the future.